Welcome to a new video. Today we're doing a teardown. I can't even remember the last time I did a teardown, so I'm pretty excited to do this one. The item in question is this uh, Polycom CX600 IP phone and it was donated by a viewer of the channel, so thank you for that. I also received this uh, conference type uh, speaker pod. It is made by uh, Jabra. On the back it says it's uh, optimized for Microsoft Link. The phone works with Microsoft Link and uh, it has this um, USB plug on the back. So I think uh, these two are meant to be connected together to enhance the uh, quality and volume of uh, conference calls. I think there is some interesting stuff to see inside this phone because of the functionality it advertises. Um, it has to be running uh, an OS, so we should see a um, quite a beefy processor inside, maybe an ARM, or considering it runs Windows Embedded CE, we might even see other architectures as well. The phone also advertises a uh, gigabit Ethernet switch, so we should see a dedicated chipset for that as well. Let me just uh, power it up for a second to show you how it looks. The sponsor of this video is JLCPCB.com, a professional PCB factory which currently has the best offer on the market. You can order 10 PCBs for just $2, so check out their website linked in the description below because it will probably cost you more to do the PCBs at home. So right now the OS is probably booting takes a few seconds as I can imagine Windows uh, C is not as fast as uh, uh, some other uh, Linux based operating systems so the screen looks to be fine it seems to be responding to button presses because I'm thinking after the teardown it might be possible to hack this system and make it run something else on that Windows CE. I don't have anything uh, particular in mind, but it would be interesting. Also, I'm curious to see where are they storing the OS? Are they using some um, surface mount uh, flash memory to store that? Or maybe they use an SD card or maybe a um, one of those uh, CF compact flash cards. Not sure, but we'll see that in a few minutes. So enough talking. Let's uh, do the teardown of this phone and we'll leave the uh, conference speaker for later. So this was quite easy to take apart. I have a connector in here. Yeah, so it's a connector for the onboard uh, speaker because this uh, does have a loudspeaker option built in but of course it's just a small speaker so uh, that external pod is probably doing a better job here is also a uh, microphone for the uh, built-in speaker function yep so this uh, would be right here at the uh, bottom of the uh, phone stand and it looks like it's a uh, two-board construction one board for holding uh, the keypad and probably the LCD as well and another board which is the uh, main board. I've taken a closer look at the board. I even uh, probed a uh, UART port so now I can tell you a little bit about this. First this is a uh, six layer board and how do I know that? It's because they've uh, included this um, layer count indicator and if we look closer, we can see on the back that it counts up to six. So yeah, that's a nice hint if you want to know how many layers uh, one of these industrial boards has. Uh, you can usually find this layer count indicator on one of the edges. The main processor is from uh, Texas Instruments. But surprisingly, I couldn't find much info by uh, googling this uh, part number. 
I'll post it on screen so you can have a go. But all I could find is that TNET is a prefix used for a family of DSL chipsets. Basically, system on chip devices which integrate multiple chips inside the same package. By probing this port right here, marked uh, serial port, I was uh, able to get some um, uh, info, some messages, and I think this uh, advertises itself as an ARM 11 processor, and that clearly is running the Windows Embedded CE, which is loaded from uh, this flash memory. Uh, it's a uh, chip made by Hi Hynix, and uh, it has a size of 2 gigabytes. Then we have these two chips from um, Winbond. They are uh, DDR2 memory, each 128 megs of memory. Next, we have a uh, chip from um, Marvel, and uh, judging by its close proximity to these Ethernet switch, uh, Ethernet ports, I'm guessing this is the uh, gigabit, gigabit Ethernet switch, and we can even see an integrated magnetics package. Uh, place between it and the RJ45 ports. This is the uh, flat flex uh, connector running to the uh, keypad board. We can see they've used the resistor capacitor pairs for filtering on each of the lines going to this uh, connector. This is our uh, DC input port and uh, we have a bunch of uh, filtering and uh, protection devices uh, around this area. Then uh, right next to it we have this um, local regulation area. There are probably multiple rails needed to run the um, processor, the memory chips and the Ethernet switch. So we have a few different uh, DC to DC converters in this area. And uh, on the back I've noticed uh, we have a date code uh, which is December 22, 2010. This is probably the uh, date at which the PCB was designed. We also have a specification for the um, substrate of the PCB, which is a TG150. A bunch of passives are placed uh, on the back, uh, mostly decoupling capacitors, and also the LCD connector is up here on the back, and it looks like uh, they have provisioned two footprints, I don't know, maybe they have another model with a different LCD panel and they are using a single uh, board for both mo models, just populating a different uh, LCD connector. I don't know much about the Windows C or the bootloader used on this board, so I wouldn't know how to interact with it or make it show the desktop instead of the default app which is loading on boot. I'm pretty sure that is possible. If you know something, maybe leave a comment below and I'll try that in a future video. Now let's uh, move on to the conference speaker pod. I don't expect to see that much inside this one. It probably needs a microcontroller to read the buttons, the user input and res respond. It needs an amplifier for the uh, speaker and an ADC for the microphone. Maybe they use the system on chip that integrates all of that, the USB interface, the switch, uh, button interface and the ADC, but we'll find out soon. Now to open this one, uh, there either is uh, some screws under this label or under this um, this soft material, or I need to uh, take a faceplate off. Maybe it's glued and the screws are under that. But I'll try my luck first right here because in the middle I can see something. So I'm gonna try there to see if there is any screw. So no luck under this label, it doesn't appear to have any screw there. So it means this face plate or the speaker grill must come off. So I'm hoping uh, to get it open easily. Well, this was a bit of a destructive uh, teardown on the enclosure because um, there were multiple hidden screws and I just lost my patience at some point and decided to use the force instead of the brain. But I managed to get it open and uh, this uh, front cap it was uh, glued on. Then there was this uh, speaker grill and there was this plastic piece which was screwed in from the back. And to my surprise when I got to the actual PCB, here is uh, the big surprise. If you recognize this is a uh, Bluetooth chipset 
and uh, this particular speaker model does not have Bluetooth capability and yet we see a Bluetooth chipset used inside. But as I have uh, worked with Bluetooth modules in the past, I know they also have a USB interface. So I think what they did here was to uh, configure this module to disable Bluetooth and act as a headset over USB. The fact that I don't see any PCB antenna, there isn't one on the other side uh, either, uh, it makes me think uh, that and confirms my theory. That is quite an interesting use of a Bluetooth module and uh, it makes sense because you have the USB interface, you have the audio input and output capability and the microcontroller that you can program to do what you need. So it totally makes sense to use something like this. And then for maybe the next model, which is probably more expensive, you just add a PCB antenna and change the firmware to enable Bluetooth and you have added Bluetooth capability and ask more money for basically the same hardware. On this uh, PCB, we also notice uh, a lot of uh, capacitive uh, buttons and probably not all of these are used because on the uh, front panel we see just a uh, couple of uh, silk screen buttons and there is uh, this chip which appears to be handling all of those uh, buttons I couldn't find anything uh, particular uh, after googling this uh, part number which is printed on the chip so yeah I don't know uh, uh, I haven't checked its data sheet, but I'm pretty sure it handles the capacitive, the capacitive sensing because it's connected to all of these uh, pads on the PCB. What I wonder though is uh, how this chip interfaces to the um, Bluetooth chipset. Uh, does it use some kind of SPI or maybe a UART interface? I'm not sure, but most likely not a UART interface. Most likely uh, I2C, uh, SPI. It's, it's the most likely scenario for this chip to be using. The pod uses uh, this single microphone which uh, connects to this area right here. And I believe we have some local filtering, voltage regulation and an op-amp. Um, then the signal must be connected to the uh, uh, Bluetooth module on the microphone input. For the speaker, uh, I can say that it is uh, 1 watt 4 ohm. Is this uh, DAIN brand speaker? I'm not sure I've heard of that uh, brand before. Uh, the enclosure seems to be designed to provide the uh, best possible acoustics for this uh, form and shape. You can see it even has this uh, kind of foam to dampen the uh, vibrations. And the speaker connects in this area of the PCB. I think we have uh, one of these uh, chips as a power amplifier for the speaker because we need that. The Bluetooth uh, chipset uh, for sure cannot drive a 1 watt uh, speaker. This chip uh, right here is a um, HC4051 analog MUX. Although I haven't uh, traced the uh, connections, um, it might be handling some of the uh, capacitive buttons Maybe this, uh, this chip doesn't have enough inputs for all of those buttons, I'm not sure. Or it might also be handling the LEDs. I don't know, I haven't uh, traced it. But it's either the LEDs or the capacity buttons because those are the only things which we have a bunch of on this PCB and they might need multiplexing. So that's about uh, all I had to say about this speaker. It's quite an interesting design to use that Bluetooth chipset with the Bluetooth interface disabled, but it totally makes sense because it has all the functionality you need built in and you can just reuse firmware and you buy more of the same device which uh, lowers your bomb cost. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Please hit the like button because that helps the channel grow and I also get a sense of what you like seeing most. So thank you for watching this and I will see you next week.